Hey everyone, Forrest with Two Bats Gaming here, and I am privileged today to be sitting down with Stephen Dewey, uh, acclaimed RPG designer of Tin Candles as well as a number, uh, a number of other game systems. I contacted Mr. Dewey after our first run through of Tin Candles, which you may have seen on our Drink and Die series, because his game was quite simply an emotional masterpiece. It was one, I've been running systems on and off for about 20 years, and it was one of the most emotionally gripping games I've ever played. So yeah, I have to say, uh, we, co we considered a fair amount of systems for our first episode, but ultimately 10 Candles won out. Now, without spoiling what happened in our session, for those who haven't watched it yet, I do think it will suffice to say that it was, for me, I consider it a masterpiece of RPG design, and, and kudos to you, Stephen. I really do appreciate you designing the system, and, and secondly, welcome to the interview, man. Uh, thank you so much for having me and for all the kind words. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm Absolutely. glad you enjoyed the game. Yeah, so speaking to emotion, um, I do believe that any RPG system can inspire some amount of emotion, especially yes. if you have like a game master and players who are willing to explore those possibilities. But Tin Candles was a bit unique to me in that the mechanics, the crunch of the game, seem to almost guide you into an emotional war one. Now, I haven't seen many RPGs that seem to use the mechanics of the game to withdraw emotions from the players. Was this an intentional design decision on your part? And if so, what was your inspiration for making such? a system uh absolutely it was um I, I i would agree with you that uh and i actually i ran a small talk about this at metatopia a couple years ago but uh, i feel that really any mechanic that's present in any game system at all mm -hmm. uh elicits some kind of emotional reaction right okay. even if even if you even if the mechanic wasn't necessarily designed to create an emotional reaction from the player, just rolling a die, oh, right, to, to see yeah. what happens. See if you that, get that lucky crit. Exactly, uh, or you know whatever it might be, that is going to create some sort of emotion for your players or for the the person who's engaging with those rules. And as I was sort of creating uh, ten candles and tossing around a lot of the ideas for what that game was going to look like, um, you know, pulling on a lot of inspiration from other uh, independent games and other independent game designers, I real I really wanted to make a horror game that focused less on the jump scares and the um, you know that sort of thriller style of uh, horror you know creating that those emotions of horror and tragedy and sadness and things like that and instead to focus more on that slow kind of creeping dread of the game that's that's, that's what I yeah. wanted it to look like that's I, I have to say that was the over overwhelming feeling we got from our game I think when I have to because this is one of the few games where the players afterwards have all independently contacted me to talk about the session. And uh, the feeling that I'm getting from the rest of them was one of dread. I don't think we really got into any direct conflict with them until very close to the end of the game. And it was much more a feeling of overwhelming fear. And just, I mean, I think literally in the middle of our session, we had... Uh, outside the game room like something fell off a counter or something like that and as i was editing it you can watch us all literally jump as it happens <laughs> and it's just that feeling of dread how did i guess i want to ask you what was when you were designing the system uh, for those of the of you who are familiar with it well rather for those who aren't i think attracted what attracted me most of the system was the actual candle mechanic itself yeah where you had the 10 tea light candles and they function as a timer of sorts for the characters quite literally because they will all die before the session is over now this isn't the only game where you've used some sort of real world object or concept for lack of a better term as a progress marker uh in uncanny valley another game we'll discuss in a minute that you designed there's the water glass for the interrogated android i'm not exactly sure of the best way to ask this but is there a reason you're fond of mixing the real world with the rpg using the timing mechanics things like that well, so there are a lot of strengths when you are building an RPG, in my opinion, um, to being mindful of the sorts of emotions that your mechanics and that the rules are going to engender in the players and the participants that are playing it. There's a lot of there's a lot of strengths there. And one of the biggest ones, in my opinion, is that if you can 
create mechanics and you can create the flow of your game, just the how the rules work to, uh, n- you know, 99.9% of the time create these sorts of emotional outputs in players um, because you can reliably count on these triggers and these mechanics to work. They're doing what they're designed to do. Then what you're going to come out at the end with is a much more reliable tabletop experience. So if I, you know, an example I commonly use, I'm a huge fan of Dungeons and Dragons, right? That's the system I grew up with. Um, But I can't grab my books, my, you know, my Dungeons and Dragons books and hand them to a friend of mine and say, you have to play this game. You're going to love it, right? Because that may not be true. Uh, the, the sorts of stories that they're going to tell are going to be dramatically different from the stories that I've experienced. And even though I maybe had a really great dungeon master or, you know, a group of players who really embraced the style of role play I'm interested in, it, it doesn't translate as reliably. That's true. Yeah, I but think it, that's, it, yeah, I get that. With something like Ten Candles, what what I sought, what I kind of set out to do is to create more of a game that was very mindful of that so that even if you didn't have a GM who was incredibly talented or even if you had people who weren't as comfortable with role playing or with a horror setting or anything like that, the game actually sort of shoulders a lot of that weight, a lot of the work that you would normally have to do to be able to create these emotions around a table. The game does it for you. So at that point, anything that the players and the GM bring that's just icing on top of the cake and it makes it even better and more immersive. But even, you know, alone, it's going to create reliably those experiences because in 10 candles, you've got that arc built in. The candles are going to go out. You have these recordings that bookend it. You have all these little arcs, every scene of, you know, tension growing and growing and growing until it hits the breaking point. And that's going to happen for every single player every time you play. So you can go up to someone and hand them a copy of Ten Candles and be like, you have to play this. Because they are pretty much reliably going to have a similar experience to the one you have that you've had purely based on the mechanics, sort of supporting that style of storytelling. Absolutely. Well, actually, that leads well into my next question, because in the group that we played with, uh, I was probably the most experienced player, but we had a good mix all the way from somebody who's run through a couple of sessions of fifth edition all the way up to other gamers who have run games, you know, for a good 15, 20 years. And I found that one of the most interesting points for me was that the newer players, specifically in our group, it was somebody named Ariel and then my wife, Rachel, who were relatively new to RPGs. They got involved in the system as much, if not more, than the experienced players. And I found that the mechanics were drawing them into the game and making them involved. It's very common that you get people... If you invite a new player to a group of old hats, they will feel a bit of apprehension or nervousness because they're around a group of people who are so comfortable with the system. But this seemed to combat that to a fair amount without being overt, without forcing them to do something. And I think probably one of the strengths, I, I, one of the, it clicked for me that it was working when we started defining truths, which is a system mm-hmm. wherein when you darken a candle, for those of you not familiar with it, each person around, each player will go around and define a single fact about the game world for the upcoming scene or for the rest of the session. And watching them come up with, well, it was funny because I think the strange dichotomy I found was the old hat players wanted to use it as some sort of advantageous moment. Yep. Whereas yeah. <laughs> the newer players were willing to look into the idea of using it. You know, For instance, we had a player say, oh, the van has a flat tire. You know, and they were introducing problems that drove the story on. Was that your intention by using the truth mechanic? Did you want, did you conceive that it would bring new and old hat players together in that common struggle? Absolutely. I mean, that that mechanic and several others are, are really designed in a way that I, I wanted 10 Candles to be accessible to a lot of people, regardless of your experience in role playing games. Um, Because what it does is really gives players a lot of narrative control over the story while while also telling them how it's going to end. So a lot of times there's a lot of things that can sort of uh, intimidate new players. Uh, If there's a game with a lot of backstory and prep that they don't necessarily know about or, or aren't as 
easily able to sort of you know wrap their heads around um if there are potentially a lot of consequences to their actions and they don't want to mess something up that yeah. will ruin it for you know the other players that they're you know just make some sort of unspoken mistake that they don't know about you know a lot of these things um can make newer players really concerned and really hold back. But because 10 candles is no prep, everyone's coming in at the exact same level. You already know that exactly how it's going to end. All of the characters will die. It doesn't matter what happens between now and then it really frees up both new players and older players to explore that and say, okay, well, all we really have to worry about and think about is what would be really interesting or what would be fun to have happen. And you do see, I, I've seen a lot with, um, you know, older players or folks who have been around the table a long time, especially people who have played a lot of games that they set out to win in, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, again, being a fine example, um, or any of the old OSR games, um, that sort of, uh, that sort of gamer, I, I have seen this thing so many times where they'll get around the table and they'll just grab onto all that narrative power at the beginning and be like, this is great. I'm, yeah. I'm unstoppable. And then, <laughs> And then they just sort of realize and remember halfway through the game, mm -hmm. oh, wait, uh, I'm not, I'm going to die at the end. Like, yeah. I literally, I literally can't change that. Huh. <laughs> and that, that sort of that dawning realization over them. And they're like, well, I, I got this bazooka because I have all the power, but what do I do with it now? It's, it's not really exciting to shoot a monster with it. Exactly. I could shoot, I could shoot my friend's helicopter because they left without me. That sounds more interesting. And you, <laughs> and you begin to see this twist as they, as they realize that there are boundaries on this story, uh, and sort of what's being asked of them and that there's a different wind condition than they normally expect. Absolutely. Is there a single moment or, I, I guess a single moment through all your playtesting and sessions of Ten Candles that you, that stands out to you more so than any other moment. I, I I know that can be hard to single down, but is there a particular moment in this game system that stands out to you that you'll always remember? Well, there were a lot of individual moments where you know maybe a mechanic came through or something. Um, something occurred to me or, you know, some feedback from a player was like, oh, that's that's so good. I think, though, one of the most dramatic moments and certainly one of the most defining moments in the playtesting process was actually my very first playtest I ever had of it, oh, which wow. I had with uh, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife mm -hmm. um, and her two roommates. And I had the entirety of what was the rule system, I think, on a single double sided sheet of eight and a half by 11 nice. copy paper. The everyone uh, is John style. <laughs> right. And we were so we were sort of working through the session and the session ended and they survived. OK. Right. Because I didn't I didn't know at the time. Mm -hmm how the game should end. Um, so we played, we played through it and they all got away at the end and we all saw back, sat back and we thought well, that was a pretty good game. And I realized no one can ever survive this game again. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, <laughs> that's amazing, man. Uh, yeah. I mean, really, I, I have to commend you on making the design because I think that that would probably be a scary mechanic to sell to people, at, at least in some sense to say, you're all going to die at the end it's, of this game. But I did find that my players yeah. were interested in it once I started teasing the concept to them. It's tricky, but the, the reason that it's so important and I've had people reach out to me or I've seen comments of like, Oh, you know, is this cool? Like, can I just have my players survive at the end? Is that okay? And that's usually the one area where I'm like, Hey, whatever you should play, however you want to play. Yeah. But if you want your character sur to survive at the end, let me point you in the direction of some really great survival horror games. Exactly. Because well, there are, let me ask there you, are, what would you recommend if people were looking for systems like that? I, I mean, I, I always recommend dread. I think it's, yeah. I think it's perfect um, in every possible way. Uh, Epidiah is a really good friend of mine. He, gotcha. uh, took, he took a look at the 10 candles rule book back way back in the day. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the time our games get sort of compared to each other. 
um, for a lot of reasons, a lot of similarities. But how I generally describe it to people is so Dread is the perfect survival horror game. Yeah. Dread it, Dread has the jump scares every time. If you're if you're sort of like keeping a monitor on your anxiety level mm -hmm. as you're playing Dread, it kind of stays low and then it spikes up whenever you have to go and make a pull from the Jenga tower, because if for those exactly. not familiar, if the tower falls, you die, right? So yeah. you have this incredible sense of anxiety. And then as soon as you're done, that anxiety drops back down until you need to pull from the tower again. It has these big jump scare moments when the towers fall, that's intense, a, a character dies, like that's huge. And 10 Candles is very, very different. If you're monitoring your anxiety with 10 Candles, it starts really low and it slowly climbs over time. We don't have any of those really big jump scare moments. But what I like about 10 Candles and how I sort of pitch that, you know, you're going to die at the end idea, because it is a little nervous, for, makes some people pretty nervous, is what it does is it completely changes the relationship between the GM and the players. If you're playing a game like Dread, like running a game like Dread or some other, you know, horror game, a lot of the time it's the players versus the GM. The GM wants to kill the players. The players want to outsmart the GM, get around their traps and tricks, try to be the one that survives. In Ten Candles, it's incredibly collaborative. It's, exactly. it's, it's deeply, deeply collaborative because we already all know how it's going to end. What matters is we all want to tell a really cool story to get us there. And that's all that you're like rolling to do in the game really mm -hmm. is to tell the story. So the players are much more like co GMs in that game. And because you know, you're going to die at the end. What it allowed me to do in the rules is give players so much narrative control that you would never see in a game where winning is a possibility. I can give you those truths. I can give you, you know, narrative, uh, you know, you won narration rights because you roll better than me or you can establish these things that are now true. You could never do that in a game where winning was an option because, of course, you would want to win because that's what the game is designed to allow you to do. You're going to find the, you know, uh, f the fallout shelter, or find the bazooka, you know, get all these supplies. You're going to use that narrative control to better yourself and to, to build more walls around yourself. But in 10 candles, giving them that narrative control, giving that so openly to your players, it allows for them to really become engaged with the storytelling and come at it almost like a co GM rather than as a player. Precisely. Yeah, the the system that you use to switch narrative rights, it's not the first time I've seen something work like this, but it works really well in Ten Candles when you mix it with the truths and the moments and things like that. So I've got to ask you a question. Uh, something that stuck out to me. On the dedication page of Ten Candles, you thank a gentleman, I think it's a gentleman named Eben Lowe for opening your eyes to what gaming can be. <laughs> if it's not too personal, could you go a little more in depth about what that means? How did he open your eyes? Yeah, no, uh, Eben is a good friend of mine. I met him uh, uh, while I was at college. He was not at the college with me, but we uh, met through a, a weekend uh, live action role playing game in the Massachusetts area that we both happened to join. Awesome. Um, and while uh, on one of my many trips home, uh, kind of to the Massachusetts area from college, I was visiting him and some other friends of mine in the Boston area. And he sat me down and were, was like, hey, I know you're here for a few hours. Let's play a role playing game. And I'm like, Eben, I don't have time for Dungeons and Dragons. And he's like, no, let's play this game called Lacuna that you've never heard of. Uh, and he and he sat me down with a few friends of mine and played uh, Lacuna or ran a session of Lacuna uh, by Jared Sorensen. Mm -hmm. And kind of opened my eyes to indie gaming in That's a very awesome. big way. So I had never really heard of these short little, like showing me this little, you know, five and a half by eight inch rule book, like mm -hmm. 60, 70 pages long called Lacuna part one, the beginning of the mystery and the girl from blue city. That's a strange name for a game. Oh, yeah. um, and we played a session of it and I absolutely fell in love. He's like, don't buy the rule book or you'll ruin all the, the, you know all the secrets for yourself unless you really want to gm it and i bought the rule book right when i got home <laughs> uh, 
and a bunch af- a bunch of other games after that. So Eben was sort of my vector into um, tabletop RPGs from a story game indie uh, sort of publishing spectrum, um, and ha- opened that uh, opened that window for me. That's awesome, man. I mean, that's kind of we're by far not the only ones trying to do this, but I did want to join the group of other excellent reviewers and gamers out there who are trying to showcase this new wave, and that kind of brings me into. Uh, you know, anybody who's been around RPGs for a while can obviously notice that within the past couple of years, there's been a, I guess the best term I could use for it is RPG resurgence. I think it kind of came along with 5th edition D&D and, you know, Critical Role, a number of other things that really started covering it. And I think all the numbers would indicate that RPGs are definitely on the rise right now. How, how have you, has that affected you as a designer? Has it invigorated you or do you feel some sense of trepidation at the new people coming in i've I've heard a lot of different opinions from designers how do you feel about this resurgence of rpgs i mean i am one of the new people coming in so (laughs) so i really yeah i mean i i really can't uh can't complain about that Mm -hmm. um i you know 10 candles was my very first game and that just came out you know, not that long ago, yeah, maybe exactly. four, four, three, four years ago. Um, so I have definitely been a part of that movement in a big way. Um, I, I think part of it uh, absolutely came out of just tabletop gaming in general, finding a resurgence through, you know, Will Wheaton's tabletop and uh, it finding a place online with a lot of streamers. Um, indie RPGs especially have been coming out uh, kind of in in strength, I would say probably over the last 10 to 15 years, they've been sort of coming back. And then with the explosion of board games and kind of by extension, one of the reasons that board games have really been allowed to explode uh, crowdfunding websites, you know, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, things like that. I don't know how familiar you are with our channel, but uh, we're primarily, we started and and primarily, this is really our first entry into the RPGs in terms of coverage. We primarily work with board games, tabletop games, but there's been such a crossover in our group enjoying both that we wanted to start showcasing it. So I think you make a good point that many people are by the osmosis of gaming, as it were, getting into RPGs through tabletop gaming as well. Yeah, and there's there's been more of, you know, more and more we've seen sort of fuzzy lines between what is a board game, yeah. what is an RPG, what is a LARP, what's a storytelling game. Um, there's a lot of crossover there um, in, a, in a pretty big way. And I think that um, the, the sort of resurgence of... Uh, of tabletop games in general also came kind of around or right on the heels of uh, indie games in video, you know, from the video game spectrum, the idea of indie games being a really big and interesting thing. So when board games came out as really a big deal over the past 10 years or so uh, and RPGs kind of along with that, uh, I think there's been sort of a growing space for indie designers um, that can be supported by things like Kickstarter and Patreon as well that can actually get funding to get these smaller projects out, but to produce them on the scales of, you know, something from Wizards of the Coast or one of these big sort of uh, companies. Yeah, no, I I definitely think that, uh, you know, Kickstarter, Indiegogo and Patreon have been hugely influential in the developing landscape of, of tabletop gaming. Speaking of tabletop gaming, you have a new game coming out soon called Gather, a new RPG. Could you tease a little bit what that's about and discuss what your plans are for it? Sure. So, yeah, Gather um, is coming to Kickstarter on June 5th uh, for about a month. And basically, that's that's a, a great example of a game that sort of blends some lines. Um, it's a tabletop role-playing game, but it's played with a deck of cards, Uh, And it's played around a a table. You're not going to really be rolling any dice or have character sheets. So in in that respect, it's also a little bit like a live action role playing game. You're going to be kind of taking up the role of a character um, and playing them for the entirety of it. But the basic premise of Gather is that the game itself is a meeting. Uh, And this meeting is called The Gather. It is held every year. Um, And... Coming to the gather, you are a speaker for a kinship. So your kinship is some, 
community, clan, family that you've come from traveled all the way here to the gather for this annual meeting so that you can share information, you can make uh, declarations, you can try to just learn information from other kinships. For whatever reason, you're here sort of as the representative of your group, of your kinship, here to share in the discussion of the gather. Okay. And uh, representatives from all manner of kinships all across this world that you live in have come here. Uh, and the world that you live in is known as the Evertree. Um, so the full title of the game is Gather Children of the Evertree. And the Evertree is this world tree, this fantastical land that you all call home, an enormous tree that you all live in. You're, you know, your little cities and societies are all tucked away in. Um, and you come to this Gather to meet. Now, the Gather is uh, a little bit tricky to uh it, it's tricky to be productive at the gather because the gather itself is very rooted in ritual and rules and law of how you can communicate with each other um how you can actually share information what you can even talk about so, all of that is very bound up in ritual and that's borne out in the mechanics of the game Exactly. So gotcha. the game the game is sort of run. It's a GMless game. It's run by this deck of cards that okay. you're playing with. Um, and you literally it's another zero prep one shot game. Nice. You just sit down with a group of people, flip the top card and read what it says and you're off to the races. Cool. Um, and as you're as you're going through the bulk of the game. Um, is in these question cards. So about tw there's about 20 question cards in the deck. And the way that the true gather is held after you get through some setting material and kind of the mechanics of how to play, and it, it teaches you as you go in, uh, you have these question cards. And the questions are the only questions that can be asked okay. um, at the gather. And it's in how you answer these questions that you play the game, how you actually, it's a world building game. So we know very little about the world, but in how all of the players answer these questions, that sort of fleshes out the world around us. So for, as an example, um, the very first question that is ever asked is what is the name of your kinship? What is your kinship called? Gotcha. So everyone will have a chance to create a name off the top of their head for their kinship, their community in this massive ever tree. Um, and that is shared around. Now, uh, you can also offer tokens to players if you want to hear more from them. So everyone's given the name of their kinship. Maybe you gave the name, uh, you know, the shadows of distant branches or something otherwise evocative like mm -hmm. that. And I'm intrigued. So I might offer you a token and invite you to elaborate a bit on that, which you could then do. Uh, and then other people could give you tokens paired with questions to even kind of navigate further down that line of questions and answers and questions and answers um, to really dig into the parts of the world that we think are interesting. And then we go on to the next person to answer, you know, who was given a token to reiterate and you go through all these questions. They might, you know, there's some general ones that sort of ask like how many uh, people are in your kinship, how many joined your kinship this last year, how many died, have any, has anyone declared war on you this past year? Um, you know, do you still remember the songs of the river? Like all wow. the, the this in, these increasingly thematic questions as you go through. And the questions that are going to be in the deck are going to change every time you play a little bit okay. uh, to give to give some replayability. Um, but it, it it's a world building game. So it's all about kind of seeing the world more and more through the eyes of these representatives on behalf of their kinships that are speaking here at the gather. Um, so it's, it's a ton of fun to play. Um, it, it's great because it is, again, a zero prep. Um, very ritualistic kind of immersive game that you really know nothing about going in, but by the time it's done at the end, you'll have had this fully fleshed out world and all these relationships between the kinships at the table. And you'll know a lot about everything that's happened before. You'll know a bit about what's going to happen after this meeting. Um, and you sort of build this narrative together, uh, in a really exciting way. Um, as all these voices kind of join together, sometimes literally in unison around the table, answering questions and asking other questions. That sounds amazing. And who knows, you might even get to live at the end. 
Yeah, you <laughs> usually this is a this is a peaceful game. You're not allowed to bring violence to the gather, so it's all good. You're walking out of there scot free. Excellent, man. Well, I really appreciate you talking to us about your games. Once again, that's coming out uh, June fifth. You said on Kickstarter. Yep, that will be on Kickstarter from June 5th until I think probably July 5th, uh, the normal 30-day runtime. So that will be available there. Um, there's a lot of uh, great designers that are lined up as stretch goals to add some setting expansions uh, like Emily Care Boss, um, oh, like Hannah Schaefer, um, and uh, a, few, uh, a few others. But uh, you'll have to check out the Kickstarter to oh, see yeah. the full list. Uh, but there's some some good folks on there. They're going to be writing some expansions for the game if it does well. So definitely check that out. We are definitely looking forward to it. You also have a Patreon that patrons can sign up to support your game design efforts, correct? Could you, you want to drop a link for that? We'll also include links in the video description. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, patreon.com slash Stephen Dewey, my name. Uh, there's a lot of interesting kind of levels on there, including, uh, you know, for those who have deep, generous pockets at $20 a level, you actually get access to another one of my games. Uh, it's a play by mail game called Mantle Warden, oh, wow. uh, which you'll, you'll get a monthly letter in the mail. Um and you'll be able to send letters back to me and basically, uh, you know, play a role playing game through the mail um, that you'll amazing. get rel pretty reliably every month. So that's a ton of fun, too. Um, but there's a lot of other benefits there at lower levels, including just accessing all of, you know, getting free digital copies or physical copies of my games, uh, getting access to my works in progress folders. So you can see all my ideas that I have embraced or abandoned. Um, but, yeah, there's some fun stuff over there. It's a great community of, of people. Beautiful. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me about your games, man. We've really enjoyed them. We look forward to your future projects. And uh, by all means, keep in touch with us. We'd love to interview you once Gather comes out. Definitely. Yeah, I'd be happy to hop on whenever. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. Thanks.